In watercolor, we have two main techniques that we use, wet and wet and wet and dry. Wet and dry is a very intuitive way to paint. It simply involves taking your wet or damp paint and applying it to dry paper. This is definitely the easiest way to start with watercolor. Most of us can grasp the concept and it works perfectly for getting hard edges and nice details. Now, because watercolor tends to make hard edges, this is not the best technique if you want to create softer edges and create that flowy, more liquid look that watercolor is known for. And so to achieve that effect, we turn to the wet and wet technique. The wet and wet technique, of course, takes timing, it takes practice, and it requires logging more brush miles just to figure out what happens when we do what. How much paint should be on your brush? How much water should be on your brush? How wet should your paper be? These are all questions we tend to ask when we're working with wet and wet, and it can be a little bit frustrating when you're a beginner and just trying to figure it all out. So today I'm going to demonstrate a dog painting. I'm gonna be doing each half of the painting a different way. In this video, you're gonna see side by side with the two different halves of the painting, how I achieve pretty similar results using both wet and dry and wet on wet. My reference photo of this cute little dog is from Pixabay. It's a free image. You can go ahead and download it using the link in the description if you want to try this project for yourself. My paper is Bao Hong 140 pound cotton cold pressed watercolor paper. It's on a seven by 10 inch block. And you can see I've already sketched on the drawing and I applied a piece of tape down the center line so that I can protect the right side while I work on the left. I'm using a silver black velvet size 10 round brush and working very directly on the left. You can see I'm just applying some light gray paint. This is just indigo, slightly watered down. Now on the right side, you can see I'm approaching the painting completely different, beginning with clear water and just painting it all inside of the dog's head. So you can see already very different approaches. You can either start with direct paint right on the dry surface like you see on the left, which is more like coloring in a coloring book, or you can start with clear water, which will pre-wet the surface and will allow for softer blended edges inside of the space that you've applied the water. Now on the left, I've painted in all the areas where I want to have black and then left a little space here where I can start applying some burnt sienna. This is in effect sort of a wet and wet technique because the two wet colors are touching each other, creating a soft edge, but I am technically still working on dry paper here. Now you'll notice that when I work on dry paper, it tends to form a hard edge right away. So I have to move fairly quickly to prevent that edge from drying and forming a permanent hard edge. So when you're working this way, you want to bring your paint to either a natural stopping point or move along really quickly, continuing to pull along that wet edge so that it doesn't form any weird lines, any weird hard lines. This takes some practice too, but I still find this to be a much easier and more intuitive way to approach watercolor when you're first starting out. It is important when you're working wet on dry to avoid areas where you want to place other colors. You can see there's that little patch of tan on the left I'm going to paint around. Now on the right side, having pre-wet the surface, I'm beginning to drop in my lighter colors on the already damp paper. I'm using a mix of gamboge nova, yellow ochre, and burnt sienna to produce those lovely tans and reddish browns in the dog's face. Meanwhile, on the left, working wet and dry, I just continue to pull along that dark gray. I'm gonna be working in layers, which is called glazing when you work wet and dry over other layers of paint to continue to build up your values wet and dry. Meanwhile, on the right side, I have a little bit of time because the paper surface is wet to lay down soft washes of color. And you can see already that the result is much softer and just a little bit more diffused looking. Wet and dry tends to move a little bit faster because you don't have to wait for layers to dry. So you can see I've already almost colored in all of the black areas of the dog's head on the left side. And just now on the right, I'm beginning to approach the gray or dark black areas with another soft wash of indigo because the surface is still wet, it's just expanding and blossoming. And we're seeing a really nice, natural, soft edge between the black fur and the white center stripe of the dog. This is something I do love about wet on wet. I don't have to apply any effort really to get that soft edge. And it just looks like super fuzzy fur, which is so beautiful. On the left side, because I did wet on dry, you can see that that separation between white and black fur is a completely hard edge. There's no subtle soft fur there at all. I'm gonna have to do some really delicate manual brush strokes as you see me doing here to make it look like white fur overlapping black fur. On the right side, I just continue to fill in with soft washes, these areas that are going to be black. 
I do like to work in layers regardless of how I approach the painting, whether that's wet and wet or wet and dry. It's definitely best to start light and work your way up to your darker values gradually. This allows you to lay down really beautiful layers of color and because watercolor is so transparent, you can see those layers beneath whatever you paint on top and it's just such a beautiful look. One of my favorite things about watercolor. So on the right side, I've almost finished laying down all the areas that are going to be black. I'm just putting some color in the nose as well. And on the left, as I work wet and dry, you can see I'm already beginning to apply some burnt sienna into the color inside of the eye. Eyes, I do tend to do wet and dry most of the time, regardless of how I'm approaching the painting, just because they are such small detailed areas. And I want that level of control that only wet and dry can allow. On the right side, it, it's a little bit more blurry, a little more blended, even the nose is fuzzing out quite a bit and I'm totally okay with that because I'm still working light enough. It's not gonna be a problem to have all that fuzz. On the left side, the ear has dried already so I can begin glazing a second layer of color, wet and dry, over the top. You can see it's definitely not even close to being dark enough yet so a second layer is definitely necessary to get it to the value that it needs to be. Meanwhile, on the right side, my initial wash has begun to dry so I can start to do some really subtle little more wet and damp textures along the muzzle and lay down some subtle washes of ultramarine blue along the neck. That was pretty much a wet and dry brush stroke there on the right. You can see the difference. It just stays exactly where you put it. So you can see already two very different beginnings. It's hard to believe that when we get to the end, they will almost look identical, but all of that really has to do with values and building up your layers. On the left side, I'm adding a second layer of indigo to really darken up that ear. And you can see the value of having an underwash of a lighter color, which helps the ear look shiny if you leave some of that shining through. On the right side, it's not completely dry yet, but I am beginning to layer some burnt sienna into the ear here on the right. And you can see because it's not completely dry, it's softening in a very subtle way. This is more wet and damp. There are definitely different levels of wetness and dryness for which you can approach the wet and wet technique. This is wet and damp, and we're beginning to approach the stage where I might need to let it dry all the way before I can continue. That said, I am using thick, creamy paint, so I don't have to worry about blooms or blossoms. If I use a brush that's about the same dryness level as the paper, I don't really have to worry about cauliflowers. I can continue to layer, but again, this does take some experience to know just how wet my brush needs to be so that it won't cause any problems with that layer underneath. Meanwhile, on the left side, I'm continuing to glaze darker. This is pretty much just a second layer right over the top of my first layer, and it's almost all the way up to the value it needs to be, which is really great. Just two layers and we're almost there. On the right side, you can tell it's gonna take a little bit longer to layer to the values I need to get to, just because when you apply wet paint on wet paper, the paint color dries a lot lighter, just because the paint's spreading out so much more. Whereas when you paint wet and dry, you usually get a darker result. So these are all things you can expect when you're working with these two different techniques. You might be wondering, do you always start with the ears? And no, I don't always start with the ears. In this case, it just seemed to make sense. I would encourage you to just paint whatever, wherever your eye leads you. Don't feel like you have to be formulaic about it or start the same way every time. Different paintings call for different skills. And so it's just really good to have a full tool belt of techniques and skills that you can dip into in any painting situation. And that's why we continue to log our brush miles to practice and to work on our skills. By now on the right side, my painting is almost completely dry. So I am beginning to do some wet and dry. I always do wet and dry on a painting, even if I do the majority of the work wet and wet. Wet and dry is your best option for completing a painting with some of those necessary darks and hard edges to really bring it home. On the left side, I'm just continuing to delicately glaze. I'm adding some soft fur texture, just using the tiny tip of my brush. Because it's all manual, I don't get that same really super soft effect that you see on the right side, but I still really like it. I don't see any problems with it at all. Both of these techniques are so essential in my repertoire. You can see on the right side, I'm not doing any wet on wet in the eye. Wet on dry for eyes is definitely my go-to technique. I did start it a little bit backwards. I didn't start with the burnt sienna like I did on the left. Once again, this just proves there is no right or wrong way to approach an eye. You could start with the brown, you can start with the black, it does not really matter. 
And now I'm filling in that eye on the right with my burnt sienna. What you can't see is that when I was doing the right side, of course, the left was already finished. So I could kind of compare my work to what I had already done and match my values that way. On the left side, which again, this was my first painting that I did, this wet and dry approach, I'm now filling in some of that tan coloring on the left side of the muzzle. Wet and dry, just applying my damp paint, which is quite thinned down and watery, to the dry paper. It's really essential when you're working wet and dry to have enough water in your brush so that your brush doesn't skip along the surface, unless that's something you're going for. That's an entirely different technique. But with wet and dry, you do need generally watery or milky paint, not anything too thick, or you're going to run into problems. The area where I noticed the biggest difference between wet on dry and wet on wet for these two paintings was right here on the neck. You can see I have to apply really quick, short brush strokes to put down some texture and just make it look like soft fur on the front of the neck there. And on the right side where I used wet on wet, it was just a, an effortless approach. All I had to do was drop in some color on the wet paper and the paint just blossomed and fuzzed out in a beautiful, really natural kind of way. And so that's one area where it's really obvious the difference between the two approaches. Now, after everything has completely dried, I can do a second layer of wet and wet on my right painting over here. You can see, once again, I'm applying clear water and just avoiding areas where I don't want the paint to seep into. For example, that little spot of tan on the eye. It's not essential that my water is totally clear for the second layer since I'm already working on a pre-colored area. So if it's a little bit tinted, that's totally okay. Also, when you do wet on wet, you can definitely work in sections. Don't feel like you have to cover the whole thing in water and work as fast as you possibly can. In fact, it's probably better to work in sections because you will experience areas drying a little bit quicker than maybe you're ready for. So if you work smaller, that will give you lots more time to work in each little section. And now I'm taking my darkest paint color and applying it to the areas in the deepest shadows around the eyes. You can see how the paint just softens so beautifully. I absolutely love this technique. I use it in almost every painting. In fact, I found it was kind of hard on the left side when I was working wet and dry to restrain myself from using wet and wet because it's become such a natural part of my painting practice. Wet and dry, of course, is so wonderful and so easy when you're working on these little details like around the eye there. And you can see the colors are pretty close. On the left, I don't have quite that same soft blended look as on the right, but I'm trying to use the exact same colors so that I can get almost exact results from left to right, if at all possible. That was what I was aiming for. Here on the right, I'm just using a much lighter, more gentle feathering approach to my brushwork to apply a light layer of indigo in the area on the head where it's in the light. And then I mix in some burnt sienna to help neutralize the blue in the indigo and also darken it for more of a black color. Surrounding that little tan spot around the eye, I want it to be a nice dark, almost black. On the left side, I just continue to layer with manual brush strokes using short, quick, parallel brush strokes and a smaller brush. You can see with wet and wet, you can use a bigger brush for some of this. And again, because the water and paint are doing a lot of that softening work for you, you don't necessarily need a tiny brush. I did switch to one here to help encourage some of the paint to spread just next to that white stripe, but then quickly switched back to my bigger brush because I can cover a lot more area, a lot more surface area with a larger brush. On the left side, because I am doing so much manual feathering details to get that fuzzy edge along the white stripe, I'm sticking with my small size four round brush. As I work, I'm constantly looking at my reference photo for guidance. I'm asking myself, where do I need to go darker? Where do I need to preserve the lights? What do I need to paint around? Where do I need to change up my colors and do a warmer color temperature or a cooler color temperature? And I can easily adjust between warm and cool by either adding more burnt sienna for a warmer color or adding more indigo for a cooler color. You could also use ultramarine, which is another one of my favorite combos with burnt sienna to create black and alternate between browns and blues within a painting. You can get such a great variety of colors with just those two. Now I've pretty much worked all the way up to the edge of where I've pre-wet the paper here on the right side. So it's time to almost begin working in a new section, but while I have some paint on my brush, I like to use it up and I can use it on the nose here for a second layer across the nose. Meanwhile, on the left, I continue to layer using my small brush, just building up my values slowly. 
and darkening up the little highlight in the eye that was just too bright. Once you get your really dark values in, it's a lot easier to tell where you need to go lighter or darker. Here I'm pre-wetting the muzzle again for a second layer of wet and wet on the nose on the right side. On the left, I'm continuing to add details wet and dry to the eye. It's really starting to glow and look alive now. I stuck with a really simple color palette here, just yellow ochre, burnt sienna, indigo, and a tiny bit of that gamboge nova. You'll notice my colors weren't exactly the same on these little spots above the eyes. On the left side, it was more muted, and on the right, I think I used a little bit of transparent orange, which made the color a lot more chromatic. So the two sides weren't perfectly equal when it came to color. If I was working without separating it in half like this, I would definitely be able to achieve a more unified look all throughout the painting. And you might be wondering, what approach would you have taken if you were painting the whole thing without doing a demo like this? And I would definitely start with wet and wet. That's almost always how I start. And I know that that takes a lot more practice, but it's such a rewarding process when you finally start to get the hang of wet and wet. It's just such a beautiful way to work. And you can see the wet and dry technique is a lot faster. I've already accomplished a lot more. The whole top part of the head is just about done. And on the right side, there's still a lot more to do, but there's nothing in my mind that compares to that beautiful soft wash of wet and wet. With wet and dry, of course, you can continue to glaze as much as you need to to achieve darker colors. I do recommend as much as possible to get your shadow tones in quickly and in one pass whenever possible because this will help prevent a murky or overworked look. It does take some bravery to try to lay down the darkest colors possible in one go and sometimes that can be a little intimidating but give it a try you'll like the fresh look of a single or double layer of paint versus five or six layers it definitely makes a difference in the overall look of the painting and in watercolor i think the best paintings tend to be the ones that look the freshest and the least overworked you can see my different approach here between the two sides of the nose. On the left side where I did wet and dry glazing, I used some brown as a second layer. And here on the right, I just pretty much went in straight with the exact color I was going for, the exact color and value. And so a little bit more of a direct approach on the right versus the left. On the left, I continue to layer wet and dry with short, quick brush strokes for that fur texture. It's important to allow some of that dark paint to overlap into the tan areas so that it looks like dark fur overlapping lighter colored fur. On the right here, I'm beginning to do some dry brush texture for the muzzle right there. When you're painting mouths, it's important if it's a furry little mouth like this, not to just paint a straight across line, make it more dashed and dotted so that it gives that appearance of fuzzy fur overlapping the line of the mouth. On the left side, I'm glazing one more layer underneath the eye this will bring it up to that final dark value that it needs to be at here on the cheek. You can see this the cheek is turning towards the shadow. And then as we approach the center line, it gets lighter. So I use a quick feathering motion of the brush so that it doesn't look like just a straight cut off line. All that fur texture really helps give it some dimension and, and helps the anatomy of the face appear curved and natural. Now here on the right side, my Second layer has completely dried now, so I can begin to do some wet and dry details over the top. Definitely when you begin with wet and wet washes, there are going to be areas of the painting where you need to do wet and dry. It's just the best technique and rarely do I do a painting where it's all wet and wet or all wet and dry. It's usually a combination of the two. So the painting on the left there is fairly unusual for me. I almost always do lots more water in a painting. It's a pretty dry way to paint but you can see it still gets really great results if you're looking closely at your colors and values and trying to match those to the reference photo. I'm using a spread out bristle brush technique here to get some of that texture on the right side. And I need to mix up some more black. We gotta finish these areas towards the bottom of the dog's head and darken up any shadows that need to go one shade darker. You can see how when your brush is just a little bit too dry, you might struggle with it catching on the surface and the texture of the paper. And so all you need to do is just gently dip the tip of your brush in the water without removing your paint. And this will help release the paint easier onto your paper as you work. This stage of the painting is one of the most fun ones to me where you get to build upon the layers you've already created and just bring it to a more finished and polished look. All these additional brush strokes and subtle little additions of value just really help it look 3D and so amazing and realistic. On the right side, you can see most of my wet and wet washes have been covered up now by some wet and dry details. 
but I continue to use water to smooth out edges, to soften, and just to make sure there are no harsh lines anywhere, except where I want the eye to be drawn. The eyes especially remain hard edges with really bright pops, really bright highlights, and stark contrast between light and dark. And of course, that's because we want the viewer's eye to be drawn into the dog's eyes. The focal point is one of those places where you definitely want some contrast and emotional interest. As I finish up the painting, I'm using a size four silver black velvet round brush in both demos. And then I switch to my larger brush where I have larger stretches that I want to apply more paint. Like here in the neck, I'm laying down some wet and dry dark fur on the right side here. Here on the right, I'm doing a quick additional glaze over the top of my layer just to make it the same value as what you see on the left. It wasn't quite dark enough yet. On the left side, I'm continuing to add burnt sienna details around the muzzle, leaving little bits of that tan color still shining through so we can get a better sense of the anatomy around the mouth. And a couple whiskers, little bits of hair coming out the top of the ear, and some wet and dry fur texture on the top of the head. On the left side, I'm beginning to apply another layer of burnt sienna around the neck. You can see the values just need to go a little bit darker, and this will also help the lower part of the mouth feel like it's coming forward in space rather than sinking backwards. Because I'm working wet and dry with the fur texture here, I have to be really careful and slow down my pace, use a nice fine point of a round brush to produce that fur texture, and leave little gaps in between my brush strokes so that you have what looks like hairs that are lit up versus hairs in shadow. And it definitely takes more time, I think, when you're working wet and dry to paint all of this fur texture. But with this very direct approach to painting, you can see the left side was definitely finished ahead of the right side. I had a little bit more I still needed to do with my wet and wet half of the dog. So I wet the neck with clear water. And whenever you have an area that's going to kind of disappear into the white of the paper, it's so important to use clean water or you will end up with a water line. So always rinse your brush as thoroughly as you can before doing a wet and wet area with white. Now here I can drop in some burnt sienna into that pre-wet paper. And I love the look of this. I just think it's so beautiful. You can see how the paint just spreads out and softens naturally. I do finesse it and brush it a little bit just to make sure that it's going exactly where I want it to go. But when you're working wet and wet, you do have to let go of some of that control to some extent. So a little more dark paint around the mouth to help balance it out with the left side. With the left side finished, you can now see how I was working on the right, trying to compare the two halves. Definitely didn't get the same color on the nose. <laughs> I think that's one of the starkest contrast areas. And that's okay, it wasn't gonna be perfect. Again, we have two different approaches for each half of the painting. So what I was most interested in seeing was how different are these going to be or how similar? And honestly, I was pretty shocked at how similar the two sides ended up looking. But you know what? It's the same artist, just two different approaches and I'm seeing the same reference photo. So I just added a few little touch-ups here and there to try again to match it to the left side. And now it's time for the big reveal. When I remove the tape, you'll be able to see really clearly the difference between our wet and dry approach and our wet on wet approach. So what do you think? Which technique do you prefer? Do you like to use a mix of both or do you like the more direct wet on dry? Do you enjoy layering with wet and wet for those soft edges? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I thought this was a really fun experiment and feel free to give it a try. If you do try this project, please tag me on Instagram. I'd love to see it. Thanks so much for watching today and I'll see you in the next video.